<laughs> so hi everybody, thank you for coming. Um, I recognize some faces and I don't recognize some others. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Morton. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Nursing and I've been running this um, Ghana immersion program for, for all of my time here at UNE, which has been six years, and then I brought it here from UMass Amherst um, six years ago. I've been going for about 14 years, um, anywhere from once a year to twice a year. We've been running uh, twice a year trips here for about four years, and um, we aren't going in March um, of this year, but we will resume the twice a year um, after August. So where is Rachel, the PT student? She's not here. She's not here? Okay, she's, she's the poor PT student that I've given the wrong dates to over and over and over again. So the dates for August are actually August 2nd through, it'll be either the 10th or the 11th that we come back, hopefully the 11th. Um, but those, are, those dates are firm. Um, and what I can tell you about August in Ghana is that it's actually cool there relative, you know, in context. And um, March is really the hot season. So August, people will find that it's very similar to here in August. It's, sometimes it's even warmer here. So it's right after rainy season is over, so the air's a little um, drier. It's not as humid as March is. So um, August is a great time to go. Um, the schools are not in session, so we can't do as much with the outlying schools, but we do, we can do a tremendous amount with the healthcare system. And so one thing I wanna draw your attention to right off the bat is the website. Um, and I, I put it right here just in case um, that's difficult to see. But if you go to um, WCHP, go to service learning, you'll find the Ghana Immersion Program there. And here you'll find a lot of um, tools that are, um, that are important for this trip. And probably uh, most importantly is the application um, and the um, scholarship forms, okay? All students in the College of Health Professions are eligible for the Barbara J. Cam Ghana Health Immersion Scholarship. And I just met with a donor about a month ago and he's increased it by another $8,000. So we have $30,000 um, and students do really well with that. And where we didn't have uh, March, I've already uh, made some awards um, but we have um, a lot of scholarship money available. In addition to that, um, we have the um, Graduate and Professional Student Association funding, that's GAPSA, and I don't know much about that, but my understanding is if you write a little proposal, um, you get something like $500 towards a trip. Does anybody know anything about that? Yeah. Um, it's $200 for anybody, um, and if you provide Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it's two hundred dollars for anybody um, inside the U.S., but if you go outside the U.S., it's four hundred dollars, um, and that covers like travel cost or uh, your like general conference fees or things like that. It's for like your professional development. Okay. So if you're using it for, say, like I used it this 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 year already for my APTA membership, but I could use two hundred dollars more because we're going out of the country. Okay, all right, so that's, that's significant. Every little bit counts. And then there's also the Global Education Scholarship, and that's university-wide. So if you, um, you need to go to the, um, the Biddeford Office of International Education and apply for that. And those awards haven't been as big as the CAM Scholarship, but most of the students that have written a meaningful essay will get somewhere in between $500 and $1,000. So there's no reason to think that you can't have a significant chunk of this um, taken care of with, with a meaningful application, okay? So these are really important. And then you also have to fill out a program a application for me. Um, you, at this point, you can send it to me, um, Trisha Mason, who really um, does a lot of the logistics for this experience is out on maternity leave right now. Um, so send the program application to me. And I'm gonna ask that you put a deadline in your head of April 1, okay? April 1 for the program application, the waiver forms, the Barbara Cam scholarship, absolutely April 1. 
and I know the Global Education Scholarships do April 1, okay? I don't know about GAPSA. I think that's rolling, but I'm not sure, okay? Um, so April 1 is the deadline. We will, as a group, hi Denise, we will, as a group, um, and we will meet face to face one more time before school's out, and we will, as a group, fill out visa applications together. We used to do it, I used, we used to have students do it um, on their own, and the consulate sort of changes the rules like every five minutes. So we'd get returns, and it was just really difficult, and it the postage costs a lot of money, so we do it all at once and we sell, sell, send them all out from here. And we will do that later, usually around the beginning of May or middle of May, we'll do that before you all leave. Um, and so that's, that's done um, by snail mail and it goes to New York. So that is um, the logistics of if you're interested in this after this presentation, that's where you're going to go. Um, also, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do, what, what the experience is, and if you have any questions, just um, email me. Um, I, I'm actually in my office most of the week this week, or call, okay, and my office number is 221-4438, um, okay? And so um, I want to just get a sort of an idea. I know we've got a lot of PT students here. Can you raise your hand if you're PT? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Okay, and there's one more. We think Dennis, two more. Okay, okay. And then we've. I know we have three nursing students down front. We have a nursing faculty. We have public health faculty. What else? Uh, pharmacy. Pharmacy. What year are you? P two. P2. Okay. And pharmacy. pharmacy faculty. And Aaron's pharmacy faculty. Education. Education. Are you Doug? Good to meet you. Um, what el who else do we have up back? Nursing. Nursing. Okay. Are you in the traditional BSN? No, ABSN. ABSN, the first, the second cohort. Okay. Who else do we have? Anybody else? Yes. Oh, Dee Dee, a community member. And we have Carol, who's a community member. Kathleen, Kathleen I'm sorry. Great. Okay. Um, Dave, are you, go and are you coming too? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift over to some slides. I think pictures really say, um, say a lot. So I'm going to, and I, I actually have, I know I have two alums that have been before. Um, Emily Farnham, who's a second year ABSN student, and Dr. Layton, who is a physical therapy faculty, have both been, and they're both planning on coming in August. So you can see how um, it gets, in you, it gets immersed in you, and you need to go back. Yeah, so we're happy to have them back. So the purpose of this experience, and it's it's really um, unlike any other um, immersion, uh, cultural immersion with a medical flair that I am aware of, because the purpose really is to provide students with a, with an experience that heightens their cultural sensitivity and awareness. Okay, because what we understand is when Health profession students have heightened cultural sensitivity. They're better health care providers. We have outcomes that, that show that. Our secondary objective is to provide primary care and related services to the citizens of Secundi, Takarati, and Consuerado. We actually have another site now in Pinson, which is another rural site, which is fabulous. And so Secundi and Takarati are urban, and Consuerado and in Pinson are both uh, rural. And then we have also have an emerging purpose, and that is we're building public health research agenda to improve health outcomes. We've had some maternal child health projects in the last couple of years. We're doing a lot of community health education within the clinic, which we're measuring outcomes. Dr. Layton's gonna be implementing a, a study in August where he's looking at um, providing physical therapy exercises to the community and looking at adherence with those because what, what we know about Ghana is that the community, it's a very laborious culture, you know, it's nothing to walk 20 miles a day and it's overuse activities and things like that. That was impressive PT language, wasn't it? Is that, is, it, is that? <laughs> so there's a lot going on and there's a lot more to happen and I'm really happy that we've got pharmacy folks here because um, 
we, have, we also have on-site pharmacies that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. So Ghana is about the size of Oregon, okay, and we, it's in West Africa, so it's about, it's, um, it's right about there, okay, and we fly into Accra here, and then we drive down by bus to get to Secundi and Takarati. We've been taking midnight flights the last couple of years um, so that we actually, um, we actually get there in the evening. We got there in the evening, didn't we? And we, uh, yeah, and then we, um, we spend the, the night in the bus getting down here. So it's a little bit of a drive. Um, Secundi and Takarati, as I said, are urban. The population's about 400,000. Um, but the history of Ghana is actually English is the first language there. Um, but in the areas that we are, you know, there are parts of Ghana that are very developing and there are parts that are incredibly poor and underserved. And when you think about that part of the world, um, it, compared to our context, it is underserved, but Ghana by and large is developing. This particular area is, is quite poor. So it's an English-speaking country, but where we are, most of the community does not speak English. They speak a West African language called Fanti. Um, so the Portuguese arrived in the 15th century. Um, the coast of Ghana, the, um, that coast was where most of the slave castles that from um, where the ships left um, uh, South Africa um, housed the slaves before they came to America. And so we actually spend time at one of the castles, usually either on the way down or the way back. We've been doing it on the way back the last few years, and it's a wonderful, very cathartic uh, experience that, that is quite meaningful. And this is um, a picture of uh, the Cape Coast Castle. It is a constitution-based government with a parliamentary um, democracy, and it's been a very stable country for many, many years. I've never, for as long as I've been going, there's never been um, any sort of um, unrest. Um, Ivory Coast next door and Nigeria, on the other hand, um, you know, they sort of um, surround it. They have had some trouble, but Ghana's been really very a safe place to go. So the people, um, range, there are um, some major tribes, like I said, um, English is the official language, and religions really um, make up mostly Christian and Muslim, okay? Um, we actually stay in a, um, an evangelical um, Pentecostal church that um, we're not a religious, we don't have an, a, re a religious affiliation, we just happen to have a partner uh, named Reverend Ando, who's been very good to us, and he um, houses us there, and his uh, wonderful son is our cook, and it's really a warm and safe place to be while we're there. So we don't stay in hotels, we stay in the community, and that's another piece of this, this that makes it really rich, okay? Vital statistics, um, you know, they, they look different than ours because the health system is different than ours, and health disparities are different than ours. Um, life expectancy, as you can see, is quite a bit lower than ours. Child mortality rate is much higher. Access to clean water um, is, um, you know, by and large, a fair amount of folks have access to clean water, but where we are, the piped water is not clean enough to drink. It's clean enough to bathe, um, but we, use, we drink bottled water for everything, and you will have plenty of that. Um, immunization rate of children is estimated at 80%. That's probably a little high. And the adult literacy rate is just over 60%. Okay. So healthcare in Ghana, interestingly enough, they have a national insurance program that was established in 2004. I really didn't see any of the um, sort of rewards from that until probably about 2009. And then sporadically, folks had this health insurance. And what it is, is um, it's, a, it's a private pay, so there's, there aren't work programs that pay for health insurance. But if a person wants health insurance, they pay, uh, it's probably a little higher than that, but 25 CDs is a, equivalent to about $15, 15 US dollars, and that will cover an individual for a year. Now bear in mind, it doesn't cover chronic care, 
So hypertension, cancer, things like that, it doesn't cover. And that's really what most people need uh, is chronic disease management. But it will cover maternal and child health services. Immunizations are free for children and some um, uh, conditions, okay? Antenatal care is through birthing centers and that is um, free. Uh, that's a, a covered service. And then, um, you know, we, you look at the free immunizations and then, then you look at the immunization rate of maybe it's 80%, why isn't it higher? Well, because of all the rural areas and the um, lack of education and the um, ability to not reach folks, it just, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to get immunizations where they, where they need to be. It's amazing what infrastructure does. And so second D, where we're actually staying, is a fishing village. And if you go online and start looking at some pictures, you'll see some, some really beautiful sites. And for the folks that have been with me, um, it's like surreal when you look at the beauty of, of the fishing village and, and everything around you. It's, it, feels like, it feels like you're out of place. Um, it's, it's quite an amazing thing. But it, the, they're coastal cities. They're the third largest coupled city in Ghana. And like I said, it's about four to five hours away from Accra, depending on how fast the bus driver is going. <laughs> um, and fishing industry is the largest employer um, in, in, uh, in Sekundi. You know, it's interesting because we've got PT, we've got pharmacy, we've got nursing. You'll see a lot of the um, same um, uh, professions. There are a lot of teachers that come into the clinic. There are a lot of fishermen and there are a lot of traders. I would say, you know, probably 15 to 20 percent of the population relies on trading goods. Okay, they have little stands where they may have clothes or, or um, types of foods that they make and they spend the day trading. They don't always get a lot of money, but they, they support their families through um, exchanging food and items and things like that. So th this program used to be called the Ghana Health Mission. We've gotten away from using the term mission because it really, um, denotes oftentimes a religious affiliation, and I just um, wanted to be careful about that. But it was established in 1996 by Reverend uh, Robert Ando, who's not pictured there, and a mentor of mine from the University of Massachusetts. Her name is uh, Dr. Lita McHenry, and she's a nurse practitioner by training, and I'm not. I'm a, I'm a nurse by training, but my advanced degree is in public health leadership. So. When I started going with her, and I was her student, um, I really brought this public health vision to the work that we were doing. And although we still manage a primary care clinic, and I get really excited when um, we have um, providers that come because we're able to be full service at that point, um, we've also done a lot of very interesting public health activities. And you know, when we think about uh, developing countries and, and places that are quite underserved, we're going to get a lot more mileage by teaching um, health promotion than we are managing diseases because you can't, you, you can't cover much when you're managing one little thing at a time. And so I have really uh, changed the scope of what we do to be um, uh, health promoting and uh, uh, disease prevention, okay? Um, and like I said, it's located on the site of the International Mission Church, which is now called the New World Chapel. That's what it's called. Is that, was that the name of it? Uh, something like that. So our health services purpose is to provide primary care to the local population, and we do that alongside the Ghana Health Service. So this is another big difference from some of the other programs that you see, have seen. Um, we don't go over there and force our evidence-based work on a, on a culture where it can't be sustained. Rather, we go over there and we have built an amazing partnership with the Ministry of Health, known as the Ghana Health Service, and we work with their nurses and one of their physicians in the clinic. And we, we learn everything about a Ghanaian health paradigm. And what we have is this exchange. And so I've had 
PT students come in the past, I'm looking at the PT folks, and you know, you may think that, well, they don't have a lot of, we call them physiotherapists there, they don't have a lot of physiotherapists, what can you possibly do? Well, you spend time at the hospital clinic, and you actually um, uh, adapt, adapt your, um, your skills and your treatments to a way that it can be sustainable with that culture, okay? And we bring a fair amount of supplies. We bring what, what can be used. And you know it's interesting because you'll go um, in August, and there will be returns from last August that, that show up to be seen. And so it runs like according to a primary care model, where um, patients are triaged by nursing students, social work students, um, by a number of folks. And then they're interviewed and examined by providers or provider students. We've had OT, PT, social work, dental hygiene, farm, med bio, and education students come with us. And because we do so much health promoting activity, there's a real place for um, education students. Also, the um, private schools are open in the summer. And so there's opportunity to visit the private schools as well. Um, we have an on-site pharmacy, and I have some pictures of that. And we, um, we use medications in the pharmacy that are typically used there. We do bring some over, but we try to support the local chemist there. We purchase a lot of our meds there. And actually, some of your colleagues, um, Steve Sutton and uh, Dr. John Schloss, who's no longer here, they actually did um, some um, analyzing of the medications that were manufactured there and they were very potent they were very um, in really good good shape and so um, we I think they they tested them over two points in time and so the local pharmacy there has been very good to us and in turn we're very good to them by providing um, provide supporting um, the economy um, what we also do is you know when health insurance wasn't robust there, what we did was we tried to pay for procedures and for um, types of treatments that um, patients would need. Yeah, we're a 501-3C, so we get a lot of private don donations. And, um, but now, you know, and again, this is that public health system's vantage point. Now, rather than pay for acute care needs, we actually purchase insurance for folks and so it gets them on a, a plan of care that is um, moving forward and sustainable. And then we um, utilize a community health worker model, and so um, we will have anywhere from 15 to 20 community health workers who are um, college-bound or college students that are bilingual or tri trilingual. There are some French-speaking folks in that area, and they help us with translation. Okay, and they're, they're also our guides. They are with us morning, noon, and night, and, uh, and they're there. So this is the main clinic site, and you can see um, this first picture there. Um, that picture um, was taken from a balcony, and where that balcony is is where the uh, dormitory rooms are for, um, for women and men. You know, I've got to see what the breakdown is before we um, put folks in rooms, but, but it's a compound. And um, so this back here is where some of the dorm rooms are. It's two stories high. And then in here is where the clinic is. And this has really changed, actually. This, these are all two stories now. Um, Reverend Ando is very entrepreneurial, and he's building, building a lot. And so what we do inside the church is we set up and we set up with church pews and a piece of plywood on top of them. And, um, and you can see over here, patients are waiting to be seen. And these are our stations, provider stations here. And you can see there's a lot going on. And that's actually inside the church. And so this is one of the rural um, clinics. And this is um, the Chief's Palace in Consuerado. And we, what we do is we set up a clinic in the village chief's home. And this is just a wait line of people waiting to come in. This is the outside gate here. And this is one of the exam rooms. So it's a little more private for patients that 
they um, can be seen in an exam room and, and um, it's a little quieter. Um, some people really love um, working out in concept. Some folks prefer second D, but what I do is I, I mix it up so everybody has a, a chance to be in various places. And with so many uh, PT students coming this time, we will probably be in probably three different sites plus the hospital. Dr. Layton's got to figure that out. Um, so if, as far as students go, we've had participation from undergraduate, graduate, and alums. All, every trip now we have at least one or two alums. It's, it's great. We also have an emerging core faculty, and this is um, really essential um, to building the student program. I left the M off. Um, you know, having uh, invested faculty that want to come back can help build the program for the students. And, you know, I think uh, Dr. Dennis's participation, again, is probably a reason why we have 12 coming. I think we might have had more. Really? Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so the clinic itself runs from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., okay? We, what that means is it's usually about 2. Um, we have lunch, and then the day is for you to immerse yourself in the culture. So this is really as much about um, going over and doing healthcare and related services as it is um, really learning about another place. And that's really important to us. And we, you know, we'll often do some health related activities in the evening, but by and large we, we run on, a, on about a six hour um, schedule. And that's really consistent with that part of the world, too. You know, people in the middle of the afternoon aren't really working very hard. It's hot, um, real high unemployment rate, and that's very consistent with another culture. Um, and so people are going out. We do have a schedule. I usually post a schedule of, uh, of things that, that can be done and are scheduled to be done, but we, we're not opposed to um, students. Um, doing um, other things as long as they're with a community health worker, okay? Um, and, and it's safe to be without one, but the language um, can be difficult, and we, want, we don't want that to be uncomfortable, and they are waiting to take us out, so. And I, sorry, I don't have a picture, of, um, but the community health workers are church members, usually college-bound or in college. They translate. They provide community health uh, education. They explain local customs and beliefs. There are cultural brokers, okay? From, the, from your understanding of what a medical translator does here, they're not certified, and so they don't have some of those um, subtleties down with, with respect to eye contact and, and really doing acute and accurate translation. They're really lay translators, but they're very bright, and they, um, they really help us get all of our needs met, not only with our patients, but, but in, the, in the cultural immersion piece too. Students get really close with the community health workers. I, I think Emily will probably talk about this when we do questions and answers, but I know there's a lot of tears at the end of the trip for a lot of reasons, but the community health workers are family. They're, you know, we've, we've lived with them for, for almost two weeks. And so the on-site pharmacy, um, a lot of antibiotics and a lot of antimalarials, and um, not a broad array of antibiotics, but um, you know uh, the very basic ones. Tylenol, um, NSAIDs. We use a lot of H2 blockers. Um, vitamins. I sort of have mixed feelings about because um, you know we may have enough to give out a package of. Uh, for a, a month, but what does that mean when it's done? We're not really making a difference with vitamins, so I feel, you know, I have mixed feelings about whether to bring them over or not. They're great, really great for the um, pregnant women, but. And then HCTZ is really um, the standard of care for hypertension. Um, it's, it's really safe, it's really cheap, and uh, it really works. Um, they, they do use, um, they do have some ACE inhibitors, but not, not, uh, not nothing more than that for hypertension. Um, dressing supplies and eyeglasses. We've had a lot of luck bringing um, reading glasses over. You know, there are a lot of 50-somethings that, 
that um, with the exception of, of not being able to see up close um, have pretty good vision, but not being able to see up close has, has diminished their capacity to be, um, to be productive. If I, didn't, if I didn't have the capacity to have my bifocal contacts, I would not be able to work. You know, that's, any of, any of you, once you hit 50, you'll understand what we're saying. So reading glasses are really critical. And gosh, I go to places like Christmas tree shops and they're $1.99, so. And then many medical problems are related to the environment. Malaria and typhoid are endemic. Um, we, we, will, we see a lot of a malaria when we're there. We, we have seen typhoid before. Not, it's not as, um, not as common as malaria, but malaria is quite endemic. So are eye problems. You know, it's a, very, uh, it's a place that's very close to the equator, and folks don't wear eye protection, and so their cataracts start forming early on. And unfortunately, there is not a really good system for, for eye surgery. And you know, once a person, and often they're very young, gets a cataract, it's typically not very, very good news. Malnutrition and dehydration go hand in hand, and we see a lot of pediatric patients and adult patients that have significant issues with, um, with mal malnutrition. Um, probably the leading culprits are um, pernicious anemia and um, iron deficiency anemia, but, but also um, a lot of other um, issues as well. Um, dehydration is all almost always related to gastroenteritis, you know, um, with uh, worms and intestinal parasites and, and all sorts of things. Um, dehydration is quite prevalent. And we do a lot with community health education with, with respect to oral hydration solution. We make Gatorade and things like that. So those are good education projects for, that students work on. So clinic data, you know, it depends on how big our group is. But we see um, sometimes more than 70 patients a day. And you know, I'm just starting to envision with a cohort that's, that's um, nursing and PT heavy, I can see us um, adjusting what we do a little bit. Um, um, I'm not sure yet who, who we're going to have for providers, but we'll, we'll work something interesting out. And then community health um, education, everything from low back pain and um, PT types of stuff to hypertension, to hypertension teaching. Most folks have not been really taught anything. Um, and um, hydration with a lot of other, we've done hand washing. The food, um, we, um, our cook is Reverend Ando's son and he is um, amazing. He actually uh, got a hotel hospitality de degree in the Ukraine and came back and opened a restaurant um, right in the, in the compound. And so these are some of the um, authentic Ghanaian meals that we see. The one, on, um, the one right here is a traditional um, Ghanaian dish called fufu and it has a um, groundnut stew that's served over it and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, did you guys have fufu? How would you describe it? Um, it's basically like rice flour mixed with water. Yeah. So some people describe it as like wallpaper paste. Some, some it's it's very um, the the idea of fufu and it's a it really is a delicacy. Um, the idea of fufu is that it fills your belly so you won't need to eat all day long and you don't need to eat all day long. <laughs> the sauce is delicious but you know you talk with any of the community health workers and they're like oh you're gonna have fufu today they you know it's just amazing. <laughs> but it's maybe it's an acquired taste. I haven't acquired it quite yet <laughs> but um, but we, and we also get a lot of rice a lot of rice dishes um, people people will say the food's good. Would you would you say it's good? There's plenty What's that? There's plenty to eat. Yeah, there's plenty to eat. Um, and so, um, fair amount of seafood. Um, you know, if, if are there any vegetarians in this group? Okay, okay. So we'll we'll talk about that, and you'll need to pack some granola bars. Okay, um, but we'll we'll talk. We'll I'll talk with um, Enoch 
our cook. But that's that's what the food looks like, and it's really you. It's the part of this. It's amazing. Um, and here is um, one of our community workers, An um, Emmanuel, instructing um, a former student on on eating fufu. You know, because um, left hand is clean, and it's really hard for an American to eat with <laughs> eat with one hand and sort of. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Um, and so the faces of Ghana, you know, beautiful children, like never seen, um, just very, um, very uh, compassionate, happy, happy culture. And the elders as well. Children will just, are just longing to be your friend and um, it's quite amazing. They're so, they're so happy to see us come. Um, this, um, when we're there twice a year, it, it, it is really a wonderful, a wonderful time for the community. And so, again, you know, the acknowledgments, this really is a partnership between the community and the Ghana Health Service, and, and that's what we do. And um, it's um, quite an amazing time, and I really hope that you all think about this. Would you like to talk a little bit about what your individual disciplines have done in the past? Okay. So, Dennis, why don't you start by talking about exactly what the PT students would be doing? So the year I went, um, the clinic itself saw about 300, patient, 300 mm -hmm. people, and PT saw 100 in the time that we were there. Um, a lot of it is overuse, back pain, neck pain, um, we also were probably most involved with the daily wound dressings of somebody that comes in with a, with a significant wound. We, mm -hmm. The year I was there, we probably had four or five significant wounds that were being dressed every day, and mm -hmm. PT took care of that. Um, so we'll do some on-the-job training on that. Um, <laughs> uh, we, did, we ended up, the year I was there, we did all of the vision tests. We did all, we, we did all the eyeglasses. I don't know why, <laughs> but we did that. Um, but a lot of it is just that overuse. I mean, a lot of it is the is the is the neck pain, the back pain, the knee pain. You know, like like Jen says, mm -hmm. they they just work so hard all day, and you know they carry things on heavy th loads on their heads, and so so that that's really what we do. I we, when we go to the hospital, uh, we go to a it's an outpatient clinic that's located at the local hospital, and that has a high neuro um, population. Uh, that's in the clinic when we go there, and a lot of pediatrics. Um, so we'll, you'll have a chance to go there and work with the therapist and actually work on patients at that, in that clinic if, if you desire to do that. And they have a corner of the room that's pediatrics, and you'll sit and be able to work with, pediatric, with, with the kids that mostly have neurotype injuries, um, CP or spina bifida or, or, or something along those lines. What was one of the more common ones that you didn't have a lot of knowledge about? <laughs> you ready? We, we saw a couple of um, mm -hmm. little kids with Bell's palsy, with Herb's palsy. Now, why do you think there is a higher prevalence of that there? <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, um, nasty deliveries. So we saw R rigorous a deliveries. Yeah, we saw yeah. a couple of um, Herb's palsy at the hospital, and then we, we learned from the therapist at the hospital how they treat that, how they brace them, and how they mm -hmm. teach the parents to change the brace from a wrist flexion to a wrist extension splint. And then we saw a couple in the clinic, and mm -hmm. then we were able to take that knowledge and actually treat the kids in the clinic and teach the parents, you know, what to do to maintain range mm -hmm. of motion while they, um, you know, while hopefully that nerve comes back. Right. And so that was, that was pretty cool to learn something from them that we then used in our own, in our own clinic. Right. Great. And so that, those are some of the things. So yeah, I noticed that the PT students were doing a lot of the vision screening, which was, which was great. Um, pharmacy, we haven't had pharmacy students come yet, but we've had pharmacy faculty come. And from the practice department, we've had Jim Krebs and Emily Dornblazer. And the, Pharmacy faculty really set up um, the pharmacy and run it for us. And so if two came, we would have um, one at each site. And um, it's great because um, I never realized how like intense pharmacists were about inventory and stuff like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, they, they have like, they think a different way. It's, it's great. Um, and, you know, I would take you and introduce you to Chris, our, um, our local chemist who um, we um, buy our, our drugs from. And the malaria preparation is, um, is really every year we get a preparation that's most consistent with the, um, the strain that's, that's of high risk. Um, and we also use uh, rapid point of care testing. And so nursing students, um, I may even have an education faculty trained to that, or um, our public health faculty might train to doing rapid point of care tests. But they're basically like a blood sugar. Um, they take a little bit longer to, to reveal a, a result. But we um, don't, uh, we don't um, treat without a positive test anymore. And that was an ethical decision that we made probably four years ago. I think we've been doing it for four years. And what, what I determined by um, uh, looking at our files for a couple of years is that we were over-treating by about 68%. Um, you know, it's, you need a positive result. And that's what WHO recommends. That's the guideline now, is they want a positive test before malaria is treated. Um, and so our nurses do everything, and I think we've got four here, and I've got a couple more that are um, interested. Our nurses do a lot of the triage. Um, they actually do a lot of the lab um, stuff. We send them out to outlying hospitals as well. Um, what else did you, do you guys do, Emily? Uh, wound care. Wound care. They like wounds. The gooier, the better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we did the wound care and yep. follow up um, and just pass them off to the provider. Yep. Kind of what yep. we thought was in. A lot of community health education, a lot of critical thinking, transferring um, patients to hospitals and things like that. Um, we've got a nursing faculty that's interested, and that would, um, uh, uh, that would be like for oversight and supervision for the students, but you guys will be RNs, and you will, you'll still be a student, so that'll be great. Um, what else, who else do we have here? Some of our, um, that would, and that would be great. There's so much to, with the national health insurance, there's a lot to do, um, and I'm just thinking um, as, data collectors and really um, spending time. We, one thing I try to do when we um, have a lot of students from different disciplines is hook them up with um, community um, members that can provide them with a great um, off-site experience. Uh, last year we had a couple of social work students that actually spent time um, out in the field with one of the social welfare office, officers and that was a really great experience. So. Um, there's a number of things, and I have a couple of community members here, too, that are interested, and I think there's a few more um, that um, don't you worry about a thing, we'll keep you really busy. We'll keep you really busy. And so what, what happens is all of the girls stay in one dorm, all of the girls' students stay in one dorm, and all of the boy students stay in another dorm, and we've got more, we've got some boys here. We usually... It's, you're usually quite outnumbered. We well, still are a little bit, but. Um, <laughs> um, and then the faculty, um, males and females, stay in another. Um, so there's plenty of room. Um, there's not a ton of privacy, but um, folks will say there's more privacy than they, they thought there would be. Um, you know, we have um, kind of structured rules about, um, about social time and that is that um, you know uh, we wear clothes that are consistent with the social mores there you know women don't wear really short sh our women don't wear really short shorts or or tank tops um, you know t-shirts and capris or skirts are great um, and the guys can wear shorts and t-shirts but again um, you know fairly conservative clothing it's a it's a very evangelical um, place and so we want to remain um, uh, re very thoughtful with the cultural um, lens there and we also have um, you know we have this 
um, rule that's actually, um, we've gotten some latitude with it over the years, but we, um, we, we stay um, on the compound at nighttime. Um, the, there's a, we do have permission from Reverend Ando to go over to the, the uh, officer's um, mess um, at the end of the day to have a cold beer or a drink of, of whatever you want to have to drink. But we don't um, have more than one and we don't um, go back over there at nighttime because bad things happen at nighttime when Americans are drinking. And so we've had a couple of, um, a couple of um, instances in the past where, where um, we had some ugly American um, displays and we almost didn't, we almost had our privileges for coming back revoked. And really it's about, it's about um, immersing yourself in a healthcare culture. And so I'm all for going over and having a beer in the afternoon. And the beers are big. They're like <laughs> really big. So, um, but we're, I'm not all for, um, I'm not all for anything more than that. And people are tired. You've been going all day. I mean, people don't have a problem with that. But if this is the kind of trip where you want to go out clubbing, well, you're not going to find one. But it, it's just not, it's not the right trip for you. Okay? <laughs> um, are there any um, are there any questions specifically for me? Do you have a recommended um, packing? Yes, we do, and I'll talk about that. Go ahead. You said about going to the private schools. What do we do in the private schools? Well, you know, it, it all depends on, um, first of all, who wants to go. I think last um, August we had an MPH student who was also a high school gym teacher, and she really wanted to go. You were on that one, right? She really wanted to go and just, as from a, teach, from a teacher's perspective, see um, what the, the cu school customs were. And she had, I think she went a couple of times actually, and then a couple of other um, participants were interested in going too. So they were, they went to see what was happening in the school, in all aspects of the school. What kind of teaching was going on, what the classroom environment was, um, and you know, of course, I think she ended up teaching a lesson the next day. And Dr. Uh, Reverend Ando um, hooks us up with, um, with folks that we've built a relationship in some of the lo local schools. And we actually, there's a, a local teacher that comes and spends time with us in the clinic too. So we, we have that connection. But the, the public schools are, are off like we are in the summer, but the private schools go year round. And so the private schools are really the church-based schools. And Denise had a question, and your question was, um, Tell me again. Oh, what to pack. Okay, so when, once we have our first face-to-face -face meeting, we'll go over the, all that, but what I tell students is pack really lightly because our laundry's done for us every day. And don't bring anything really nice because it won't be nice by the time you come home. They really wash clothes on a washboard with borax soap and, um, you know, so they, so I don't recommend bringing anything nice, um, you know, yeah, don't bring your SpongeBob underpants, <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> um, yeah, but they're, they're really your underwear is for the community to see. Um, but you know, uh, uh, three or four changes of clothing is absolutely fine. And you know, I will say, bring you know, bring a nice skirt and a nice top because we will go out to dinner a night. But you don't need to bring um, an array of nice clothes. And you probably saw um, from, um, where was it? Um, is that it? No. Well, <laughs> photos and reflections. Um, well, I'm looking for the shot of everybody. Yeah, I think it's on the application in 20 Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. 
No. Oh. Nope, that was it. Um, anyway, um, anyway, oh, there it is. You see that a lot of um, beautiful Ghanaian fabric, um, batiks and tie dyes. Um, the the community makes the, us those to go to church um, the, on the on the last Sunday that we're there and so it's really wonderful and so we have this and there's also a local seamstress that will come visit very soon after we get there that um, will take you out to fabric stores and students really love having clothing made um, but that's um, that's an example of some of the beautiful fabric that's made there in West Africa um, and so um, you can see Dennis in his shirt up there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's Dr. Krebs. Whoops. I don't know what I did. Dr. Krebs. Um, I don't think Emily was on that trip. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Oh, I was going to ask as far as getting there, can we meet here? Or? Well, it's, a lot of it depends. We search for a really the, the best the cheapest um, and the best flight that we can. And it, sometimes that means we have to go to London. Um, but I really love getting a direct flight. Last year was a little tangled because of the Olympics. And believe it or not, we had to go to London. And so, but it all depends. If, if there are students that are on rotation on the West Coast, sometimes it's easier for them to meet us in Europe if that's where we're going. But we, Trisha and I, We'll work with you, um, but it would be helpful to know sooner rather than later than where of where you're going to be, because we will probably buy the tickets um, uh, middle of April or so. Yeah. Yeah. So it may be, it, it, you'd probably have to come to New York anyway, so it may be most beneficial to meet us there. Um, well, if, if we go out of Boston, we, we go to New York first because there's no, New York and Atlanta are the only um, cities now that that run a flight um, there. Um, yeah. Any other questions? So actually, to, to go back to what to pack, um, you know, clothing, our laundry's done for us. Um, you know, t-shirts and capris or skirts. Um, um, you know, um, nightwear, um, a reading lamp. Um, you know, a number of things. And what I ask students to do, and it's really quite easy to do, is save one of the, on an international flight, we get two check bags to save one of the check bags for supplies, because we will go to Partners for World Health um, to get supplies. And um, they can get everything they need in one um, checked bag. And just, and comfortable footwear, a pair of sneakers, and a good pair of sandals, a um, lot of walking. Um, if you're a runner or you exercise in the morning, that is entirely possible for you to do. You ran every day, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the community workers is an insane <laughs> runner. What, sub five, easy? Yeah. Yeah. And so um, he'll take a group out every morning. Um, there's a nice running path. Um, and it's really a fabulous way to see um, the culture early in the morning, the little children bathing outside, and it's just wonderful. Um, scrubs for clinic time. Um, and you know, I don't require them, but they're really comfortable and they're cool, so scrubs are a good idea. Um, snacks, 
and a lot of protein-based snacks. Um, if there is something that you don't enjoy, um, try to predict whether you're not going to enjoy it or not, and don't put a lot on your plate because it gets it's kind of sad for for them, you know, when they they don't have a lot of food to 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 serve um, others that when we leave food on our plate. So. Um, you can usually have a good idea if you're going to enjoy it or not, and and bring bring a lot of snacks, nuts, dried fruit, granola bars. And you guys are the experts. Or peanut butter. Peanut butter, peanut butter goes a long way. We usually have eggs in the morning, um, eggs, oatmeal, um, pretty pretty traditional Western breakfast, um, and then lunch and dinner. Lunch is the big meal, um, and it's usually a, a Ghanaian dish of some sort, and then. Um, and then either, uh, you know, something a little lighter at nighttime. And we all eat together. We have a debrief about the day. It's a great, great way to talk about the day and things that you saw, things that felt weird, things that felt odd, things that felt great. Yeah. Um, I noticed some of these memorial ceremonies this year. Yeah. Well, we can certainly talk about that now, and I'll probably defer to the pharmacists here, but the three preparations that I'm familiar with are um, larium, malarone, and doxycycline, which is an antibiotic. And, you know, different people will be described, prescribed. Um, you, it's usually malarone or larium, and I've been seeing malarone prescribed more than any, more than larium now. I, I take larium, which is a once a week, um, but, I, you know, I've heard that there are some nasty psych side effects. I've never had one on the trip, so that that's comforting. <laughs> that wasn't <a> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but most folks are, are getting larium, um, I'm sorry, malarone, which is a once a day. And we have, um, you will need to go to a travel clinic and get some shots ahead of time. And, you know, be thinking about where you're going to do that. If you're definitely going to go, make an appointment at a travel clinic pretty soon because they can be hard to get into. And India Street um, has a travel clinic at May Medical Center, the India Street Clinic. And I will tell you, I don't know what kind, if some of the students are on their parents' insurance, but people are telling me now that the shots and the scripts are about $250 now. Yeah. Well, you need to have the shots before you apply for your visa. And we're going to apply for the visa as a group in early May. So it is going to be here. It's not going to overlay on clinics and governors. We won't be doing it this summer. We'll be doing all those shots. Yeah, you should get it done pretty soon, I would say. Yeah. I mean, certainly you have a month or two. But um, you know, I, my understanding is a lot of the clinics aren't open all the time now. And you may just want to get an appointment. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh no, it's fine. No, these these um, the only um, one that has a limit is yellow fever. It's five years, so you'll be fine. And and don't be if you're comparing notes about your immunization experience, don't be worried if somebody got one more thing than you did. Travel clinics have different philosophies. They look at the CDC website and they predict what the highest risks are. And so some of you may get Hep A and some of you may not. But you have to have yellow fever. And you really should have typhoid. Do you have a listing that you can give us? Um, I can I, actually. I think it's on the website, but yeah, I can actually. I'll I'll send it to you too. But again, it my listing's not necessarily going to be what they say. But you have like you have to have. You have to have yellow fever. You have to present proof of yellow fever to the consulate before they'll issue you a visa. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And so, um, you know, we we're also we're all healthcare professionals, so we um, we we talk about healthcare at nighttime, and so we give each other reminders about our malaria meds, so nobody gets sick. <laughs> yeah, I will be honest with you. You know, it's the piped water isn't considered clean, um, 
And um, you know, we, we are very careful. We're around sick people all the time, so you know, we're, we've got to wash our hands, and, and we're, we're more susceptible because we are around sick people. And we usually have somebody that goes down. Did we have anybody go down on your trip? Yeah. Um, with a, what I call, I call it a case of the molly grubs, and it's just a little GI thing. But we, we bring a traveler's antibiotic like um, Cipro and start it when, when, start it when, as soon as something happens, but keep in touch with us all. One of you is going to go down. <laughs> Not for long, but you will. <laughs> I've been down, but it's a good, it's a good experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just, I'm being honest, I'm being, I'm being transparent. Um, what other questions? Yes. Um, I know you already kind of talked about the religion component, but sure. also how like, culturally appropriate it would be, but are there other health promotion projects that are in any sexual health? Yes. That's a great question. As a matter of fact, um, that's been a real paradigm shift since I've been going. We're allowed to have education um, sessions now surrounding HIV um, and STDs and and you know we've really worked Reverend Ando over the years and he's really um, you know it's, it's still always something we ask him beforehand we actually had um, condoms last um, that we gave um, the men and he's been he's really come a long way and you know that's that's what you're talking about from that health promotion perspective is is um, very telling in, in, in how far um, that part of the world has come. So does it mainly happen at the clinic sites, or are they, ever able, are, are they able to travel in the schools? We can do it in the clinic sites. Um, we, could, we could ask to do something in the, um, in the private schools, but we have often um, scheduled something for an evening um, community health education event. And, and we tell a couple of community health workers to spread the word, and we'll have 50 people there. Yeah. Patient adherence is also very different than what you're used to. If we ask a patient to come back the next day, they not only come back the next day, but they come back two hours early. You know, the adherence is, is really fascinating. I've done a couple of research studies over there. And you know, you always expect like a 30% attrition rate hardly any at all, you know, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I guess as yeah. you guys are beginning and as you're coming and whatnot, because the parents will be there teaching healthcare and they have a bunch of kids, if you can have donations of like coloring books or any sort of craft, it helps a lot with the flow. They're so patient and kids will sit there for hours, so it's great to interact with them too if you're not doing anything. So. That's something fun that a lot of church groups and schools or schools that mm -hmm. um, enjoy being a part of any of those. And we'll have, we'll have a full service clinic because I do have a nurse practitioner and a physician coming. So we'll mm -hmm. be able to do diagnostic and prescriptive work. Um, and, my, and if we have um, pharmacy representation, that would be great. Um, and all the nursing and wow. Tell your friends. We would probably um, um, probably um, need um, with a with a group of twenty five students. We'd need uh, three or four faculty. Um, we need nursing supervision. We need PT supervision, um, and then depending on what other um, students we have. So, any last? Final questions, or can, if you want to ask me anything privately, I'm happy to do that. But thank you very much. <laughs>